You think you're going to make this beautifully <laughs> manicured apple tree and give it more health? But if you cut off everything, all you get is wild growth everywhere. If you don't, uh, I'm not sure of another analogy for you if you, don't, <laughs> if you don't garden. But that's one place you can see this in nature as well. So in the normal aging brain, as we lose brains, aging across the lifespan, every time we lose one, the ones that are left standing grow more branches more dendrites, they sprout them. And by sprouting more dendrites, they can make more connections with the other synapses. So it turns out, I don't mean to say at all, it's not a big deal, it's that it's a different deal than what we thought it was. We thought there was nothing that could be done, but this is the way it really works. Now this bottom line represents what happens in a diseased brain with a disease like Alzheimer's disease. One of the things that happens in Alzheimer's disease, which is not normal aging, is that the body, the brain, loses its ability to do this. When those cells die, not only can they not sprout, they shrivel. Now, Thanks to the hotel serving grapes this morning. See, all I really want you to do is learn. And I'll do anything to try to get you to learn. And the thing I'm going to do right now, if I can keep all my wires straight here, is to show you another representation of the process I just showed you with a brain cell. I was describing this lecture to some friends of mine. And I was getting excited, as I am now. And you know, sometimes when I get excited, people look at me and, and say things like, do you think anybody really cares about neurogenesis? <laughs> I say, well, of course they do, because people care about their brains. And they say, you know, it's not a word that goes tripping off of everyone's tongue. I, they think I have this idea that you're going to go home tonight and talk about neurogenesis. Well, that's exactly the idea that I have. It's not a hard word. And they said, you know, if you could just come up with some kind of picture. Well, this is a true story. While we're having this conversation over brunch, we're eating grapes. Every time I pop one off, my friend notices something. There are little branches left behind. Thank you, sir. Um, she looks at it. And she says, is it anything like this? I said, that's exactly right. How many grapes do you think I'll have to eat to make my point? <laughs> <laughs> she said, you can stop when your mouth is full, because that would be impolite. <laughs> so I'm going to stop and swallow and let you ponder. This is what we're talking about. Now, these are left behind, so it's not exactly right, because they're not growing. But this is what it looks like. You lose the cell. The branches left behind can make more connections. That's what we mean. In the service of full disclosure, all of this, this whole wonderful neurogenesis story that I've been telling you, as far as we can tell right now, does not take place in all parts of the brain. It doesn't take place in this part of the brain called the neocortex, this sort of so-called higher, higher functioning parts of the brain. Now, we don't know at this point if it doesn't or if we haven't been able to figure out how to show it. And we haven't been able to figure out exactly how to get neurons, um, uh, new nerve cells that we might plant from one area of the brain to another to grow. We don't know exactly how to modify the human environment to try to stimulate this elsewhere. But we are so on our way. The really good news, though, is that the hippocampus is a critically important part of the brain. And those of you who do work in the field or just read enough or have a friend with Alzheimer's disease know that this is the part of the brain that goes first. The hippocampus has a very important, here it is right here, that's the brain tissue of the hippocampus. This, it, it 
<laughs> it comes from the word meaning seahorse. It's a Greek word, and there's the a pictorial representation of that. But the human hippocampus has the job of being the new, I mean, the primary relay station for new memories. The hippocampus is that part of the brain that tells the rest of your brain, save this for future reference or don't. If you think about the process of memory, if you think about trying to remember things today, you're, you're hearing something, maybe you want to remember it. Here's what's happening in your brain. The first thing, if you want to learn something and you want to remember it, is you've got to pay attention to it. You've got to concentrate on it. So you have to attend, and then you have to register it. You have to make mental note of it. So it's not just enough to look at it and pay attention. You've got to note it. You might do that by uh, saying it, giving it a word, spelling it, whatever. Attend, register, and this is all going to the hippocampus where then you say to the hippocampus, and this obviously you don't do it out loud like this, keep this, I want to remember this. And the hippocampus says, okay, and sends it into storage. Then when you want to remember it, that's what we call remembering, but memory's been going on all these other stages, you want to recall it, the hippocampus signals the other parts of the brain and says, she wants to know her mother's phone number. She's dying to hear how that story comes out. <laughs> OK? And you pull it back, and you retrieve it. Recall's a little different. Recall is you see something, and you say, I've seen that before. The memory's so rich. We think of it as just like this one little thing. You remember or you don't, but it's very rich. It's got all these places. Well, the hippocampus has the job of deciding what goes into storage and what gets discarded. And some things along the way that help the hippocampus are things like, and you know this, how important the memory is to you, how much emotion is attached to it. Things that are emotionally laden, we tend to remember more and longer and better. We also know just from the fact that we've all been students at one time or another, that the more you repeat something, the more likely it is you'll remember it. The hippocampus loves repetition. It's a way of signaling to the hippocampus, I really want to know this. That's why I've said it five times. OK? So repetition is a signal. Emotions are a signal. Lots of studies around aromatherapy. Linkages are a signal. And great new studies coming out about music and memory. Turns out that music is stored throughout the brain. So if you hook things to music, there's more attachment to memories. So the hippocampus is very important. So it's a good thing that we do neurogenesis there. We just don't know enough about it yet. Here are some cool things that we know. We know that if you look at the hippocampi of London tax drivers, they have bigger ones. <laughs> bigger hippocampi, London taxi drivers who, until GPSs came along, had to memorize all of the streets in London before they could get a cabbie license. Any of you who've ever been to London know that some of those streets are what we would call maybe like a quarter of a block long, some old like cow or carriage path, as well as a lot of, uh, a lot of new like developed streets. There are a lot of streets to memorize. And somebody got the great idea of looking at people who already had like these phenomenal <laughs> memories and simply putting them in a CAT scan. See, now we don't have to kill people and slice their brains. <laughs> now we can put them in CAT scans or PET scans or functional MRIs and take a look at these things. So that was cool. And then the other thing that we know is that in dementia, as I've already mentioned, of the Alzheimer's type, there's a much smaller volume there. So what can we say about the aging brain? It is slower. We probably, with all the practice we want, may not be able to achieve the speeds of processing or learning or reaction time that we had in our youth. Just as marathon runners cannot achieve the same times that they had in their 30s. But they can finish. They can finish marathons. The aging brain, unless trained, is less efficient. That's true. 